Here at the Alan Turing Institute, our mission is to make great leaps in data science and artificial intelligence research in order to change the world for the better. This podcast explores the research, ideas and technologies behind a data revolution with the people responsible for shaping our future. Welcome to the Turing Podcast. And welcome to another episode of the Turing Podcast. This week, we're really excited to be joined by Andrew Holding, who is a senior research associate at the Cancer Research UK's Cambridge Institute and a fellow of Downing College, Cambridge. So today, we're going to be talking to Andrew about his work using machine learning to understand the biology that underlies breast cancer to help improve treatments. I hope I've done an okay job of explaining that. Um, thanks for joining us, Andrew, and welcome to the podcast. So... First up, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your career um, and what your connection to the cheering is? My career actually started out as an organic chemist. I did a chemistry PhD and that was after doing a chemistry degree. And what I started out on was looking at how bacteria make antibiotics, because a lot of antibiotics that exist, are we found them from things that already, you know, are making them in the wild because these things have been spending a, an eternity fighting each other for who can survive. And the ones I was interested in were for targeting MRSA, so they were really important. Uh, and that kind of shifted me from being a chemist, eventually, via a long route, which I won't share the whole thing with you, to a biologist. Hello, everyone. And, and welcome to another episode unsurprisingly, of the, the things podcast. we were looking at in Today bacteria, they reappear Foden, in a lot of places, of and mainly the sort of proteins and the as well as way they work together led me eventually to Today become a cancer biologist. Work with the Turing in and I can imagine that doesn't seem the obvious route to everyone, but I promise you that it is a, a pathway that was found. And where, what sort of happened is during that sort of journey, is the world changed a lot in cancer, biology, and genomics became a field in the sense that we suddenly got this ability to sequence genomes for affordable amounts of money, and all these genomic technologies turned up, and we also got these other technologies like proteomics, and all these omics appear, and we suddenly have a lot of data. And for me, that was really exciting, and it, it sort of led back to the fact that a long time before I ever was a chemist, I used to spend far too much time playing on computers, and I got very much into quantitative data, which of course does overlap with the physical sciences more than perhaps the biological sciences. And that's how I ended up here sort of as a physical scientist now doing experimental biology and also combining it with machine learning. So before we get into sort of your research specifically, can you tell us a bit more broadly about how machine learning and AI has helped cancer research and diagnosis? Because I think this is probably an area most people don't know that there's such an overlap. Yeah, so as I said, I'm an experimental biologist. So a lot of the stuff I do is quite a long way away from machine learning day to day. And we'll, we'll come to that. But in terms of sitting in the field and going to talks and seeing what's happened, the sort of really exciting things that people start to bring up are these ideas of digital pathology. So this is where instead of handing your pathology, your, your sample from your patient to a doctor to look at, a pathologist, you hand it to a computer. And there's a whole load of ethical and challenges there which we're still working through. But one of the key things is if we can crack this, we can get pathologists who don't get tired, who can screen a lot more slides, and we can then use the human beings more precisely when they're needed. And we can, you know, even if we just tomorrow start to say, well, we'll tell you what, we'll just put the computers there as a second pair of eyes, catch those mistakes when someone gets tired. That doesn't really feel too creepy to a lot of people, but could save a huge number of people. The other things we talk about is computers are really good at finding patterns, when we pass them a pathology slide, they may find bits of detail there that hint to something that normally we'd have to go in with a needle to find. And that means we might be able to do less testing, less biopsies. 
And I think what's really interesting about that is a lot of people worry about this AI revolution taking over. And I'm sure you've had other people on this podcast say this, where certainly in the medical field, it's more, they are tools that work alongside us. And, you know, the biggest criticism against AI software is, you know, it's a black box. We don't necessarily know what it's doing. Well, I'd argue that we don't really know what's going on in the head of most pathologists. They can kind of describe it, but generally they'll tell you they know cancer when they see it. And that is really where we're coming from. It's these abilities, these technologies, just not to supplant, but to work alongside and provide a consistency and reassurance where we can do better. That's, that's not in question. It's not that we're necessarily doing badly. We just want to save more people. Yeah, so I suppose an example that I've come across of this is with detecting skin cancer. So I know that's something that, I mean, I think it was you know at my GP surgery, um, that's being used quite widely, I think, now. Um, and yeah, it definitely didn't replace the kind of presence of a doctor, but it definitely sped things up, I think. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and I guess particularly at the moment, you know, we know that the NHS is under a lot of pressure, doctors under a lot of pressure, you know, arguably there's a, you know, a need more than ever for this kind of relationship, I suppose, is kind of how I see it. Yeah, and the the skin cancer is an interesting one because most people have a mobile phone. You can point it at a picture of your own skin. And if you're not completely wanting a computer to be involved, you can then, of course, send it off to someone for a second opinion. What we're still working on, and I, I like to often raise this because I think it's really important, is that there are challenges. Just as people make choices based on prejudice, what is showing, though, is if these algorithms aren't made with good diversity on the teams... Skin cancer, melanoma, usually happens on white skin. If you don't train the software to see a diversity of patients, your computer program will only work for people with white skin. And this is the kind of challenges we're seeing underneath is it's not, it's basically repeating the same mistakes. So we have a real opportunity also to do it right and get it right now. And that's something which I think is really important to understand is there's a huge amount of research in going, well, how do we do this right and get it working rather than just repeating the same mistakes that come before yeah i think that's a really really important point to make um which has come up kind of again and again on the turing podcast and definitely in kind of research that i've seen at the turing um so i suppose now i'd like to get onto your research so um i appreciate this is easier said than done but in a nutshell in a nutshell can you tell us what your research is how did it come about what's the aim why is it important, basically? My research, as I said, I, I started out as a chemist. I'm now probably called a molecular biologist. Names are flexible. Uh, what I'm really interested in, what I really try and focus on is like machinery. So that this is the sort of geek in me that likes to take things apart and see how they work. And in breast cancer, in 70% of cases, so in the majority of cases, patients are classified as estrogen receptor positive. And what that means is the bit of the cell, the little bit of machinery that receives the signal for estrogen, so that's why it's called a receptor, that drives the, the growth of the cancer. And if you block that, it, it in quite a few patients, actually, that does a really good job at stopping it growing. You need to then do a few other things to, to actually make that into a treatment. But that that's the simple premise. Now, why that's important is because that isn't the end of the story. In some patients, you give them the drug that blocks that signal, and then they relapse. So where I come in is I want to know the machinery that works with that receptor, because what we know that happens, basically receptor gets jammed on, the drugs stop working because they can't turn it off anymore, but there's other wiring that goes with it. And I want to know what that wiring is. And that's really, to me, is pulling apart those pieces. So I'm working on these levels of these pieces that do the wiring, turn on genes, respond to those hormones, which is a long way away when we're talking about digital pathology. And where machine learning has been really good for me is, as I said, computers are really good at noticing patterns. What we did quite recently is we took a load of patient samples and we looked at what genes were turned on and off in different patients and used that to predict what things were controlling those genes. And we followed one of these up, it's called GRHL2, and we were able to predict a new function for this protein or piece of wiring that perhaps is another piece part of the puzzle 
that will then go on to so in future when we talk about patients relapsing maybe this is something we could target in those patients but you know i'm i'm a molecular biologist so i'm as far away from the medicine as you can probably get slowly finding those little bits of pieces of the puzzle that people then build on after me and what machine learning has really helped us is solve this problem that we can now make huge amounts of data genomic data and then you know I have to look for it and, and I just don't have the ability to look at 20,000 data points for each patient that's, that's just not possible yeah I suppose as well you know with cancer treatments you know it's a it's a large puzzle where there's you know every case is slightly different as well um so would your research kind of allow you to be more personalized in how we treat cancer is that one of the kind of aims do you think or is that just kind of another i mean it's, it's, it's always another thing and and the great thing about you know you're saying about cancer be different i i totally believe and i don't think this is controversial now i talked about 70 percent of patients being estrogen receptor positive in breast cancer there are these different classes there are people who have done genomic analysis and said, well, there's, you know, there's not four, there's 11 or whatever. I think most people have accepted that actually every patient's slightly different in terms of how their tumor presents. Of course, they're different in who they are. That's not even in question. I would go as far and say every cell in that tumor is different because they're genetically unstable cancers. So they're all mutating. They're all doing their own thing. And that means, yeah, we absolutely need personalized therapies. The challenge there is we're never going to, or not in the near future going to develop a single therapy for each person because then there is no clinical trial so you're taking a huge risk if you're doing it and, and maybe someone will resolve that challenge but what we can do is the type of research i'm doing where i say well i found this little piece of the puzzle if someone then finds another piece of the puzzle and goes well ooh, we're seeing this happens in five percent of patients can we then look in the literature what's been published and they find my research that says well we found what this piece does that then slowly goes along towards that point where we can go, right, let's start making a therapy. Maybe this is something we should target. And then we can get to what I refer to stratified medicine. So you don't necessarily have lots of, you know, millions of treatments, but instead of having five, you might have 100 or 200. And really giving that information to the patient and to the doctor to pick the best thing off the shelf that's going to work for that patient. And that's incrementally getting there. It's not particularly revolutionary i know and you know people like the idea of it being revolutionary but there is something to be said in medicine and pushing new boundaries to take things slowly and this will get better as genetic technologies get cheaper we'll be able to sequence every cell in a person's tumor and we'll be able to make even more informed decisions about what we're doing how we use that we're going to find out and it's going to be fun trying to find out because the science is going to be great and it's going to have be great because it's going to actually bring benefit to people but we're not today we're not saying we're going to give a different treatment to every cell in a patient because that's just a regulatory impossibility with how we currently see medicine just on that um you mentioned obviously about patients being kind of maybe earlier about maybe being concerned about having a machine be the thing that analyzes their results and then obviously it's talking about incremental progress and i think it's something we were discussing uh, within the turing and some of my team members about how um the media tends to portray ai related things as oh something has completely transformed this field because this algorithm does something amazing or machines are going to come and ruin your lives by and doctors aren't going to look at it and i guess with this sort of research how do you kind of mitigate it potentially against that kind of risk of media representation being around like a miracle cure that you've come up with in kind of distorting it in my in my research as i'm saying i'm looking at these molecular small things these little bits of system and i want my research to be as usable as possible and therefore for me i, I mean my risk is slightly different but it, the same things apply if i do a machine learning approach if i find a bit of the wiring of the cell using one of these ai or another type of machine learning i would say i want to publish all of the method how did i make that so in, in terms of a neural net when you train these neural nets on lots of previous images well where did i get that data from is that data available these things are important because that allows you to reproduce my results and in science reproducibility is, is one of those things that you know if you do the philosophy of science comes up as being a key concept of what science is its ability to reproduce stuff now philosophy of science is a big field but that is something that hold quite well across a lot of people's disciplines i think that applies when you take it all the way to the clinical level you if you buy a bit of software 
that's meant to diagnose people, but you don't know what images it was trained on. You don't know what the algorithm is. It's all closed source, and you're charging a fortune for it. That We can do better than that. We, we can have... These are the training sets. If you want to check for racial bias in the training set, it's there. You can look at it. If you want to see the neural net, if you want to, you know, pull it apart, it's all there. And, you know, Google recently got in the news with this protein predicting software, another machine learning solution that predicts how proteins form in three dimensions. And my first criticism of it was the fact that it was a great result. It was a scientific paper, but no one can run that software use that data, use that model, because it all runs only in Google's system. And what they showed is Google can do really well. But I, I don't care. I don't want Google to do really well. I mean, I don't mind them doing well, but I want my, if I'm the patient, I want to know that that software is, you know, reproducibly giving the same results for every patient. I know it works for people like me and it works for everyone. And, and we need that reproducibility, that transparency in our work. And for me, this is easy. I don't, I'm a scientist. I get paid to do science. I don't get paid to spin out a company and make a profit on my machine learning. And, you know, some scientists do both. But my current values are we need to absolutely build trust by not going back to this closed source, closed algorithm environment that has basically defined most of computing. And I would say more recently, we're getting better and better people looking for those reproducible, those open algorithm things as the internet's grown. Most people are used to open source now. So as part of researching for this, I was reading your recent Turing blog about using AI to rewire breast cancer treatment. Um, and as a non-scientist, I thought it'd be good to kind of clarify around, um, you mentioned that you're using uh, CR, ISPR or CAS9 technology as like sort of the basis for this research. Um, and I think to analyze individual cells and cut specific genes out. And I just wonder if you could explain a bit more about what the technology is and how it works. As I was saying, my previous paper I talked about, we use patient data to get a lot of data and work out how things are wired by looking through that. The challenge there is patients only cover a small subset of what's possible. So what we need is actually to see what happens when we break every gene in the cell and see how that changes how the wiring in the cell works. That doesn't necessarily happen in the cancer population. What we therefore decided to do was use this technology called CRISPR. And what CRISPR does is actually originally found in bacteria. It's the way bacteria fight viruses. But what it does if you move it into a human cell and sort of rework it as a tool is you can send the CRISPR pair of scissors, as it is, to any part of the genome, and it will then cut the DNA there. And all it does is it cuts it and the cell then tries to repair it and then it cuts it again. And eventually what happens, because it keeps cutting so hard, is when it repairs it, it makes a mistake and that can end up deleting that gene. And what this allowed, allows us to do is what we're doing at the moment is we can then do this to a large number of genes. And, and this is what's really, really cool about it, because we can send a different gene target to each cell, and this is really neat stuff. We can then have each individual cell have a different gene deletion. And we can also send a barcode with it in DNA. So you end up with a DNA barcode in your cell. You end up with a gene deletion in your cell by this CRISPR thing that's cutting away. And then we now have the ability to sequence single cells on 1,000, 6,000 at a time. So I can have do 6,000 experiments with basically one Petri dish. And that's why that's really cool, because what we need for machine learning is this large amount of data, which we can then use to plow through with these algorithms to then basically build the wiring. And that's what that project's all about. And yeah, it's absolutely, there's this technology that CRISPR came along that we can make in a single particle, effectively, the instructions to tell a cell to try and cut this gene, to keep a barcode of what it is. And um, actually, we also make it glow green, because that means we know it's worked. How how old is the technology? I mean, has it what kind of previous applications has it been used on? I'm quite, I'm just I mean, it's kind of blown my mind slightly as someone that's not a scientist like that. There's several technologies there. So the idea of making individual particles, we actually they're actually viral particles. So that that's ancient as stuff. But using it in a safe way and using, you know, the modern genetic techniques. I mean, these viruses are lacking every single thing that you would think of makes a virus. You, they can't really infect cells very well. They can't reproduce. They can't <laughs> do any. That's why we use them. But they, they do transfer DNA into the cell. 
Um, the CRISPR is one of these things. It was found quite a while ago in bacteria, and it kind of got ignored. And then it got repurposed as this molecular scissors. And that's, you know, that won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. A bit before that, it sort of was in every newspaper. And, of course, there was the controversy over the CRISPR babies um, over in China where they actually genetically modified human embryos, which I don't think anyone approved of that experiment. I don't think the, and the scientists who did it hasn't been responded to well. Um, so they're really recent, but some parts that have been around longer. And, you know, it's... That's the thing about science. Very few things are turn up overnight. They've generally been bubbling away, and then suddenly they gain traction. And it feels like you have these monumental changes. But in fact, there's a huge amount of work going on. And it's really... It's, what it's given us is this really reliable way to edit genes in Petri dishes. In theory, it works in people, but the current feelings is no one should be doing that. And... It was that person who did it, literally did it to get there first. And that's why people have questioned the ethics of it. It must be really exciting being a scientist with this kind of all these things coming together. Um, do you feel like you've kind of arrived at your a point in your career in, you know, at the right time? Or, you know, kind of how do you how do you view it from a kind of your career perspective, like all these things coming together? I mean, for me, as I said, I, I was down one track and then all these omics technologies appeared. And for me, that that yeah. redefined where I was taking my science. But I think you're always doing science. If you're doing it right, you're always doing it with cutting edge. You're not retreading old ground. And I think there's always interesting things to discover. If it's getting harder and harder just because the amount of information that's been generated is getting faster and faster, and it is challenging to keep up. But as you say, the technologies are getting more and more exciting than what we can achieve. And I don't think there's ever a right time. You, you just you just embrace what is there or you or you don't. And if you don't embrace what's in there, you're not really doing science. You're, you're doing something else. And, you know, it's it's a funny one because, you know, if you turned around and you did a really 1960s bit of molecular biology on a 1960s system and got a very classical result, but it showed we could repurpose uh, old drug to cure something that nobody had a cure for, that would still be revolutionary. And I think that's just realising it's, it's not... Uh, the technology is getting fantastic, but it isn't all about technology. It's about really answering those questions that excite you. And what these technologies have enabled is different people with different ideas to try different things. And that, that does keep it exciting, but it doesn't mean we couldn't do huge amounts before yeah i suppose kind of my next question is you've you've talked about how you know the data you can collect works particularly well with machine learning um which you've, you've already kind of answered but specifically why breast cancer i think is it i mean i know there's a huge amount of research and literature on breast cancer is that one of the reasons or you know I, i'm just interested in that um well there's a few reasons one of the key reasons is as i said i i came from a particular background and I have been looking at these proteins. So the proteins are the things that genes encode in the DNA and they they do stuff and then there's the DNA. And I've been looking at how proteins forms gr blobs, groups of them, complexes we call them, on the DNA to do stuff. And when I was at one stage of my career looking for the next thing, I wanted to apply some of the methods I've been doing halfway between chemistry and biology and I came across the estrogen receptor. And the estrogen receptor has some unique properties which make it really good for the kind of stuff I was doing, so the kind of tools I was good at. And that's because most receptors in the cell sit in the membrane at the edge of the cell because you've got this big... Cells are like a balloon. They stick there. And the reason they do that is because most things can't cross that cell membrane because the membrane is fatty, inside the cell is watery, and you know, oil and water don't mix. So... The, these comp messages, they have to be picked up on the outside of a cell, and then a protein does stuff and sends that message to the inside. Estrogen can actually go through fat. It's a, it's a fatty chemical. It gets carried to the cell, and then it just goes straight in. And what that means is the estrogen receptor is a nuclear receptor. It sits right in the nucleus. And when it detects estrogen, it literally binds straight on the DNA. And that meant I could go from a person who'd been studying protein complex on the DNA to the ester receptor sitting on DNA and it fascinated me and it was this fact that you can turn it on and off by just adding one molecule estrogen 
So that that was the molecular side that worked really well for me. Then there's the sort of justification why we should fund the research, which is 70% of women get ER positive breast cancer. It's the most common cancer in women. And when you look at the data, it's and let's be clear, there is no such thing as a good diagnosis of cancer. The only good diagnosis is not getting it. Um, but it gets put down in the better diagnoses because if you look at about five years, survival's better. As I say, it's a, it's a terrible term. Um, but prognosis is not as bad as other, some other cancers. But when you start to look longer term, actually, these patients start to, to keep relapsing when other cancer subtypes are not. And really, that's the other thing. There is a medical need that if you get estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, you are w- going to be more worried about relapse than some of the other types. And given the prevalence of the disease, that's a really important challenge to tackle. So you've got my molecular interests at one end. I mean, you've got that societal need at the other end. And that's really where you sort of want the things to overlap because that's where you can do good science. And yeah, you know, I'm very lucky that that happens. Some people have different interests and pick up on a different societal need and that's really just how we saw our careers evolve is if there isn't a need we generally can't go down that route but there usually is something and it's not hard to find if you if you want to have that impact great i think um kind of leading on from that and some of the other points you made earlier where you were sort of talking about like the whole black box of algorithms being used by things like google um in the kind of real world applications is what are some of the technical and ethical challenges you think that your research in specific might have to deal with or has already overcome? And how kind of how have you dealt with that or how do you think you might deal with that in the future? Every project I do, there is an ethical committee in the department I work in who want me to sign off that I've thought about these issues. And that that can be actually quite trivial in some ways that you don't predict. If you research breast cancer and you find out a result that could really upset breast cancer patients, that is an ethical consideration. And that that means you do have to worry, you know, can I just publish something without thinking about it? And the answer is no, we shouldn't be. And that's quite hard because I'm not a sociologist. I don't always know the impact of my work. So these panels exist to try and make you think twice. And, uh, you know, if... This cuts across all research, but sometimes there are unintended consequences. Then there's the fact that I'm using patient data. So when I talk about machine learning of the RNA levels in tumours, so the genes for health on and off they are in tumours, I have to be confident that that data has been sourced ethically, the, the organisations have actually got consent to do it, and when I get it, I don't want, because I don't need it, I don't want any identifying material. So I want to know that's anonymized data. Otherwise, I'm on the way to accidentally publishing a load of personal information about a person I never intended. We also use patient samples. So we have to make sure they're collected with the consent of the patient. We have to make sure we use them properly. And if you've ever come across the uh, story about the HeLa cells, this is Henrietta Lacks. So you can... There's a Mortal Life Henrietta Lacks is an interesting book about it. Those cells were collected many years ago without patient consent, and they are now one of the biggest cell models used in labs across the world. Yet the original patient, who has long passed away, never gave their permission. And this is, you know, quite troubling. And the world has moved on, but the in moving along, that means we all have to consider when we get samples from what we're doing them. This led to things like the Human Tissue Act. So on every level, this ethics comes in. And then, of course, the final thing is what people normally are going on about is if you do a machine learning learning algorithm and it's diagnosing people and it could be making big decisions, is that ethical? Um, but it goes across every layer of your research. And, and, you know, we when we apply funding, we have to make ethics statements. We have to discuss this. And it underpins everything we do. So I guess it's about... Or it sounds like it's pretty much entirely about just sort of putting the patient at the heart of every decision you make rather than, or not rather than the science, but as a priority of saying, is it going to impact the patient or how is the patient impacted rather than saying what would get the best result? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, it doesn't take a big imagination to think of unethical science that you could do that would have, a, would, you know, massively shock people and probably get a headline news. Uh, you can easily get into headlines by doing the wrong thing. 
it's as simple as that. For if you are, and I, I would say this is probably true of most people in my position, if you are motivated by the belief that you're doing a research job to improve the quality of life of individuals, you're going to want to put those people at the heart of the research you do. That doesn't mean you can't make mistakes. It doesn't mean we are naive about some of the implications of what we're doing. But hopefully the checks and balances that are in the system will call you up and go, no, no, you, you've dropped the ball here. Think about this a bit longer. And usually before it goes wrong. Yeah, and you, talk, and you, just, you, know, you talked about earlier the kind of importance of having a wide data set, you know, lots of different people. I mean, is that something that you're kind of considering in your research or, you know, is that something that's really important as well in this research? It's definitely something I consider. And the challenge for me is if I want patient samples, they're actually quite difficult to get hold of. It's, you know, as we said, there are, there's a lot of measures in place to stop you just walking along and taking samples from people. Um, quite rightly, because it would be a little bit jumping down the street with uh, and collecting samples yeah. is not okay. <laughs> but then, of course, you're limited by the diversity of my samples. And it might be that you get a patient type and you only can take it from one hospital in the UK because they're the only people who have signed up. And that hospital may be in a very affluent area of the UK and not represent the UK at all. It certainly doesn't represent the world. And we we are aware of this. And I think one one thing that you're always looking for is can we fix it? Can we do better? And being honest about the limitations of the research you do. Because you can't fix every problem. You can't control for every possible variable. But you can be aware from it. The other thing, of course, and this is something... I, I have some say in because I hire people is making sure the staff are from a diverse background. You know, we hear a lot about this today, but if you start bringing on a diverse set of backgrounds into these panels, into these ethics committees, into the lab, people go, have you thought about this? And the answer is, if you have got a monoculture, no, you won't think about it. So again, it's, it's at every level. And when I hire people, you know, it, the biggest mistake I could make is hire people like myself. And that's something... I'm always warned by my colleagues against it. It's very easy. If you find someone with similar ambitions, similar interests, similar desires of yourself, you think they're a good fit, but actually you're not going to get anything from it. Yeah, it's always important to be challenged, I think, as much as, you know, you don't necessarily want everyone to agree with you or already think like you, basically. Um, so I suppose kind of my next question, I mean, we've talked around, you know, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. According to some sources, a woman is diagnosed every 10 minutes you know, thinking big, like, you know, how will it work to change cancer treatment? And what do you think the future of this research is? You know, what do you hope it will achieve in five or 10 years, you know, thinking further in the future? For, for the, these rewiring projects we're going for, where we use machine learning to explain the wiring of the cell, I would love in five years just to find a few potential new drug targets for resistant cancer. So patients who have relapsed and treatments don't work. And just find new potentials that we can put out there as research papers for other people to read about. Now, they it may not be our ones that we put out there, but if other labs are doing the same thing, then in 10 years, hopefully, some of those are starting to look really promising. They can start go to the point where, and this is just how research works, go in to become candidates through funding from pharma, from organizations which can actually translate that from being a research paper into a drug and at the moment there are certain ways that happens but i've in 10 years i suspect we'll find as we get more and more high throughput people are more and more pushing for these precision medicines i think there's going to be new and interesting opportunities but that's you know that depends how the financials work depends how pharmaceuticals industry restructure but just being able to have one thing to actually push the whole way through would be fantastic so i think an interesting kind of different angle i guess on the kind of role of ai and uh like machine learning in terms of uh breast cancer diagnosis is kind of obviously covid19 has had i feel like it'd be wrong to not cover covid uh considering the last year um it has like a massive impact on breast cancer diagnosis and treatment and i know um that that is something that you sort of touched on briefly in the blog post you wrote for the Turing Institute. And I was just wondering if you could like expand on that and like maybe if there's a role for your research to sort of work alongside that sort of backlog and diagnosis or whether there's a sort of general thing that it could influence. It's, de it's definitely more at 
the general level. It, the kind of research we're doing, the concern from COVID isn't so much that we, because we're not, we're, we're at this early biological level. The concern is this research is slowing up, the funding is getting harder, and that could be delays. And the delays won't be now, they'll be in five, ten years' time when those results I was talking about aren't there because, we, you know, people haven't been able to get in the labs, people haven't had their contracts extended because funding's been cancelled. So that's the, the real immediate challenge in our labs is how we can keep that research going. Of course, yeah, we're also finding that patients are not getting diagnosed as quickly. We're finding that patients are having to wait longer for treatment and all these things are really, really concerning for patients. And, you know, patient advocacy groups and cancer charities are doing, trying really hard to minimise that. And, and I think it was a good point you raised earlier. These technologies like digital pathology, these technologies which involve sequencing to work out what's wrong with tumour and more precisely target it, these have a role in relieving stress on organisations like the NHS. There's always a challenge. We've seen with the COVID vaccine how long it takes for you to do a clinical trial. And they are some of the fastest clinical trials ever done because they have so much of the resources behind them. Those resources aren't there right now for cancer. Uh, and, and that's a real tragedy. What we, what we need to do is just work out how to balance it. But of course, we can't balance it if those ICUs are overloaded and those people with immediate needs are. But it's, it's compromised. And this is why we are doing things like locking down, of course, and we are trying to stay at home. So... I think absolutely machine learning has absolute role in helping us deal with this, whether it's patient diagnosis, whether it's systems that identify patients who come into the ward, what they potentially could have wrong with them, if it's going through clinical records to highlight them earlier so we can prioritise the people who really need it now. All these opportunities are there. What is a not going to change is we're not going to be able to rush this out during a pandemic because it just takes too much there will be some benefits some things will be coming on but we won't fix everything um and i think that there isn't whilst that sounds a little bit you know lacking optimism i don't think i am saying that. I, I think the potential's there i just don't want to oversell it and i think that's a mistake. If you oversell things to patients, if you oversell your research, people then go, why haven't you delivered? And that's why I'm very careful to say I am the reprogramming of breast cancer stuff I put in that blog post. The stuff I'm doing with machine learning, it's not going to deliver something tomorrow. It's not. If you have breast cancer now, I am unfortunately not able to say I will have a thing in clinical trial for you before, before the illness runs its course. But we will give the GPs, the doctors and medics, all the resources we have developed over the last 50 years for that disease. And that's constantly getting better. And I think that is really where people see these things were always coming and they're still coming. And we just need to make sure that the underlying research doesn't dry up. And that may not feel immediate, but that's the reality of how things take time. Your research in AI is not sort of a magic bullet that will fix things. But do you think Instead, it's been the case that the impact of COVID on sort of the health system and scientific research has maybe highlighted areas of vulnerability or potential research focus that, you know, pandemics are potentially more likely to be a thing that happens consistently in the future. And these are areas that um, the scientific community might focus on in a way that previous to COVID wouldn't have been a priority. I think there's definite things that are going to come out of this, you know, machine learning has the ability in theory to predict pandemics before they happen but it doesn't mean they're magical it means that you know we were not when we were seeing spread a lot of us were going oh it's like flu oh it's you know these things have been said you can think that if you fed a machine hour and enough data it will give you some kind of no no you're not taking this seriously enough there are opportunities to do this the the, the question though isn't I don't feel whether scientists are interested in doing this. It isn't whether th these technologies can help. There's definitely opportunity there. It's where the funding is and it's who's going to pay for it. And this is a science policy. And what we've seen over the last 12 months is there is a definite antagonism between the science and the politics. And what if you want to see things to prevent 
pandemic's in place, you need to fund it and you need to prioritise it. And you, you then need to decide where where's the money going to come from. And it's very easy, I feel, and I see a lot of my colleagues saying this, and I, I do feel like saying myself, is you just need to fund this. You need to fund this, 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 and this, and this. And, of course, I don't have to stand up on a podium and say what I've cancelled to do. I don't have to justify it. Uh, and that it's very easy to tell you what the best thing is. If to be honest, with a pandemic, I would say the best thing was we locked down and nobody went to work March last year. You can give me a loads of reasons why on society levels, on economy levels, why that was never a realistic option. And that that's the challenges. And I find science policy really, really interesting because it when you try and take something where you can give a really nice simple answer that totally doesn't work when it hits the real world it shows why we need different people and you know not just diversities of background but also diversities in skill sets and us sitting on the hard data we, we can tell you answers to a lot of these questions implementing it is very different so when going back to your original question will machine learning will these technologies play a role in anti-pandemics in future cancer absolutely I would also say we probably have more people skilling up in these skills right now than any time before because people can't get into labs. They're going, well, what public data can I analyze? So these resources are, are happening as a consequence of it. What we need to do next is for people who have looked at what will have the best outcome, people who've actually done the research on society and the research on the economics to come forward. And I can have very strong opinions, but fundamentally my strong opinions are based on I want to see cancer patients do better. I don't have to implement it. And I, I think that's where what COVID has really shown is that challenge where science sits slightly to one side sometimes of the political system and the people who are working really hard bridging it often get forgotten. Yeah, so I suppose it's lots of different things that come together. Lots of different worlds have to interact with each other. And that is has been shown to be a massive challenge in the last year. Um, so slightly off your research now for my final question um, so I was looking through your bio when I was doing research for this <laughs> um, and I've noted that you won an award for science communication and outreach and I suppose this is something that's very close to my heart as I work in communications and I suppose can you tell us a little bit about I guess what this award was and why it's so important to effectively communicate science with the public and perhaps Again, this has been highlighted in the pandemic, I think. Yeah, so the award I won was the Cancer Research UK, I think it was Rising Star in Engagement Award, something like that. It was the first year they ran it, and it was a, it was a wonderful thing to be recognised in that way. And what I ha I've been doing quite a lot of public engagement, and one of the things I found is I, I didn't generally focus actually on my own research. I focused on science in general. And I worked with a lot of other people, worked with other scientists, and we just tried really to help people engage with the public, find new ways to talk to people. And, and it also gave me a great opportunity. So I got to work with things like the BBC, things with local radio, and talk about science. And sometimes I would just go on and be a scientist and just show people, come on, ask us questions, we'll try and answer them. We, and I'd be happy if I didn't have the answer. It, it was fine. But the real thing where it really stemmed from is about... 10 years ago is where I really started getting into it. And it wasn't that long after some big things had sort of turned up. So must have been probably 10 years before that was Andrew Wakefield and the his anti-vax stance. And this was this big thing that Andrew Wakefield had done some research which got published. That actually, I, I've read the paper a few times and I actually don't think it says a link, but he linked vaccines to autism. And he, he, the paper may not say it, but he said it very loudly at a press conference. And that had a big effect because a lot of people I know then were anti-vaccination. And anti-vaccination has existed as long as vaccination exists. But it's that, how do you go about changing the opinion? And then you can go and look at something else like climate change. How do you do that? How do you get people to, you know, realise this is actually an emergency? It's not just change, it's a, it's a disaster. And the other one, which... I actually often end up being lighthearted, but it is is a real issue when you look at it, is this idea of homeopathy. These are these remedies which people often mix up with herbal, and so they think there's something, but actually there's, they're just sugar pills. Uh, but the NHS at the time had seven homeopathic hospitals or something, which were basically had no evidence in what they're doing. We were spending money on these hospitals, but not on nurses. 
And that actually led to um, one of the things that got involved in was a mass homeopathic overdose, uh, which nothing nothing happened at all because they're just sugar pills. Um, and that got quite a lot of press. Big sugar go. rush. <laughs> I I, they're not even big sugar pills. Um, oh, no. <laughs> they're just really expensive. And boots stop them. So it's like, why is a high street book holding this non-medicine? And there's quite strong laws about what you can advertise them as. And they get around it by saying, well, it, people use it for this, not it does this. Um and it was quite a few things like that I was doing at the same time. And it was really from this idea that we needed to engage. And engage means a two-way discussion. This idea that, you know, it's not about saying you must vaccinate your kid. It's like, well, why aren't you? What's your investment in? Why are you so on this side? Why do you why do you go to homeopathy? Why do you do this? And explain to them there is a risk. You know, people say, oh, well, if someone wants to take a sugar pill, what's the risk? Well, as soon as you start legitimizing homeopathy for a cold, you then find someone starts legitimizing it as a vaccine for malaria. And that was found out on Panorama. That kills people. There's, there's no doubt about it. You find that someone doesn't vaccinate their kid and then, you know, measles kills them. These things happen. And I guess that's really where it came from is I just felt this passion to actually communicate with people, find out what they were feeling, but also just try and nudge a little bit, because it's not a huge amount an individual can do, back against these quite big organizations, which we're now seeing more than ever, really fighting the science. And I mean, more recently, it's become more hilarious. Flat Earth seems to become a massive thing in the last five years. And I'm sure it's just people winding up me up. I'm, I'm not sure anyone genuinely believes it. But it's still there. And you've seen it with COVID, the misinformation. And I loved it when it first came out because there are people who obviously don't do much science communication going, well, if we just explain them the facts, they'll listen. And you just saw, saw all the climate scientists going, no, no, we've, we've had this for 50 years. Um, it's, so the passion comes from, you know, I genuinely feel that understanding these things will save lives. It will lead to better quality of life. And I believe the real challenge is not that science is some alter. It does challenge, if you mentioned it's got challenges in policy, it's we need to open that engagement. We need to find out why people fight these things. And when you start doing that, there's a huge opportunity to shift perception. And in my mind, everyone should be vaccinated. Uh, vaccinated because if you don't get vaccinated there are people who will die because we don't have this community immunity to protect the vulnerable i think you know we all need to do a bit about climate change because i think we are going to hit a problem where the world is going to be awful for all of us because the resources will run out and i just don't want to sit and think well i i left it to someone else yeah i think um what's well, something i found really interesting in the last year is that on the one hand you have this what feels like a really high prevalence of things like anti-vax, especially related to COVID or anti-mask movements and like this kind of pushback against scientific um, ideas. But then you also have a lot of, um, so I don't have a scientific background at all. Um, I would say my biological knowledge is very low. And a year ago, if you'd said that someone could say to me, oh, the R number is this, and I would have understood what it meant and its impact and understood things like those sort of scientific concepts, I would have been like, of course, I'd never understand that. Why would I know that? Um, so there's kind of like a, an increase in sort of general knowledge of very quite specific infection scientific ideas. But I kind of feel like it's quite a weird contrast between the two, I guess. No, and there's been fantastic work done by some organisations and some absolutely terrible work. Uh, I, and I will say, uh, the, some of the slides put out by the government have been nonsensical but i mean there was the maths formula they put out at one point for the tier system i think it was and the entirety of maths twitter was just i mean it, they weren't doing a great deal of science uh, mass communication they were doing just in despair at how illiterate the thing was and i'm sure whoever made it thought, well it's just a lovely it's an illustration it doesn't have to be accurate but they use mathematical symbols and that means something and it made whoever the prime minister of his country looked like an idiot because he was just presenting rubbish. But it isn't always just maths. Um, you you may have seen the stay-at-home COVID sign that recently got withdrawn because they decided to show all the women in it um, were doing housework. And you go, that is an example of where we have to do better at communication. And, you know, stay-at-home is a science communication issue. And the one thing is we... we 
that it was used to stereotype unintentionally but that isn't that isn't okay so yeah there's been some wins and there's been some failures and i think we should be look on those people who've done really well and kept it balanced and, you know have explained these concepts and then i think there should be some deep reflection by some of the stuff actually put out by the uk government which has been terrible and we can they should definitely be able to do better great thank you um so i think that's it for all our questions so thank you for joining us today uh, it's been really interesting talking to you and kind of learning a bit more about sort of ai and how it relates to cancer treatment and kind of your research but just uh obviously people might be listening to just want to find out more and kind of where can they find that and reach out to you and ask any questions or have a look at more of your research cancer research uk have a fantastic website if you have any questions about cancer so i'd, I'd always recommend you go there because you genuinely can trust what's on that website uh, and they do they, they hire a really good team of science communicators to do that um that there is also if you want to talk to me personally i'm on twitter as at andrew holding and i will happily engage with people and reply to any messages on there um and that's really probably the best way to get hold of me if you're just interested from anything you've heard today i should also add andrew wrote a fantastic blog for the turing website um called rewiring breast Ca- or treatments to breast cancer or something like that i should have had rehearsed that but it was i think it's a very accessible route into your work yeah and i, I anyone um who's interested in it, i'd love to hear from them because it's always great to talk about what we're doing and i mean i haven't gone too deep into it today uh deliberately because i'm trying to keep this light and trying to keep you know at a level but any questions i'd love to explain it more and i you know i could my job is to geek out about that every day so i'm more than happy to keep doing that i love that research thank you so much for joining us yeah thank you no worries thank you for inviting me if you have an interesting topic you'd like featured on the show a guest recommendation or a burning question email podcast at cheering.ac.uk The Turing Podcast is hosted by Ed Cowstrey, B. Costa Gomez and Joe Dungate and produced by Dan Whitfield for the Alan Turing Institute. Music for the podcast was provided by Jam and Sun. You can check out his latest releases at jamandsun.bandcamp.com.